13. And we will begin reading from verse 1. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. When you're there, please say amen. amen. So the Bible says, Then the same day, or the same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in parables saying behold a sower went forth to sow and when he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up and some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, but others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Then we had the scripture reading where the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? And he answered, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but unto them it is not given. It says, because they were slow of understanding, and that's why he spoke in parables. But then in verse 18, Jesus goes on to explain the meaning of this parable. And it says here, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he that receives seed by the wayside. Jesus here describes this first part of the parable as those that receive seed by the wayside. And the Bible says that those who receive seed by the wayside are those who do not what? Do not what, everyone? Understand. They do not understand. What does it mean to understand? Help me out. What does it mean to understand? That's right. So to understand is to mentally comprehend. And so what God is saying here, the parable is saying, is that those who represent this first ground, those who receive seed by the wayside are, wayside, are those who do not mentally comprehend. And the Bible says, and the wicked one comes and catches away the seed. So the question is, why does the wicked one do this? And I want to suggest something to you this morning, that the wicked one is actually the original wayside hearer. You see, in this parable, Jesus says this is a parable of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So I want to look this morning at this parable in the context of what actually happened in heaven. According to Ezekiel 28 verse 15, the Bible speaks of Lucifer and says this, of him, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. So what do you think perfect means? What is perfect? Without blemish, what else? Without fault, okay? How was he without blemish or without fault? How? Physically? Okay, yes, is that all? What else? Spiritually and mentally. So, so Lucifer was created physically whole, ment uh, spiritually whole, and mentally whole. The word here for perfect 
The Hebrew word tamim, it means this, entire, integrity, truth, without blemish, complete, full, perfect, sincerely, sound. Sound. What does that word sound mean to you? Solid, right? Stable. So, so let's, let's build on that. Lucifer, when he was created, he was mentally sound. He was mentally stable. He was mentally holy. Yes? Now, does anyone know that the word holy is actually connected also with the word whole? Right? To be whole means to be holy. Now, when we think of, like when Jesus says in his parables or when the Bible says that someone was made whole, what do we think of? You know, the man with the leper, he was what? Healed. He became healthy. He became healthy. So please follow me now. When Lucifer was created, he was mentally whole. He was mentally healthy. Satan, Lucifer, had good mental health. Yes? Okay. <clears throat> so we understand so far that he was mentally sound, he was mentally whole, he was mentally healthy, but then he began to do something, did he not? Yes. Let me ask you something. Did he begin to doubt the Word of God? Yes. And let me ask you something. What happened when he began to doubt the Word of God? What began to happen to him mentally? Did he begin to have mental health issues? Yes. Yeah. So we can say that Lucifer was actually the first being ever to begin to experience mental health issues. Now, don't, don't jump ahead of me, and please don't think that I'm saying if someone has mental health issues, you know, that, that they are somehow of Lucifer. That's not what I'm saying, but I need you to follow along carefully. What did Lucifer begin to do with the Word of God? He began to doubt it. How many of you agree with that? Why did he doubt it, though? Is it safe to say that there were some things about the mystery of God that Lucifer himself did not understand? Yes. And, and is it fair to say then that because of this lack of understanding that Lucifer became a wayside hearer? Yes. Yeah? Remember, in the parable, those who hear the word of God but do not understand it, do not comprehend it, are those that are described as wayside hearers. So the Bible tells us uh, uh, that Lucifer, a uh, uh, created perfect, created mentally whole, begins to doubt, and this doubting leads to mental instability. He's now got mental health Issues. I want to read a statement to you from Darkness Before Dawn, page 9, and it says this. It is a masterpiece of Satan's deception to keep the minds of men searching and conjuring in regard to that which God has not made known and which he does not intend that we shall understand. So are there some things that God doesn't intend for us to understand? And we're supposed to be fine with that, amen? Yeah. However... It goes on to say here, it was, it was thus that Lucifer lost his place in heaven. He became dissatisfied because all the secrets of God's purposes were not confided to him, and he entirely disregarded that which was revealed concerning his own work in his lofty position assigned him. By arousing the same discontent in the angels, under his command, he caused their fall. Was Satan the first wayside hearer? Yes. Yeah. Matthew 13, verse 20. Jesus goes on to say, But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receives it, yet he has no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is what? He's offended. 
Got another question for you. Was Lucifer first a happy worshiper of God? Yes. Yeah. What does it mean to have no root? So when John the Baptist said, now is the ax laid to the root of the tree, what was he saying? What is the root of the tree? It's the foundation. It's the foundation of the tree. So let me ask you a question. Is, is Christ, is the word of God our solid foundation? But what happens when you start to doubt the word of God? Listen carefully. What happened in Lucifer's mind as he started to doubt the word of God? Did that eventually lead him to stony places? I want you to check this out, guys, because what we're about to see is that all three of these grounds have their origination in the mind of Lucifer. He first doubted the word, and now that led him to this stony place where, where because he has no root, when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is what? Offended. When the word of God called Lucifer to repent, was he offended? Yes. When the word of God tried to bring Lucifer back from his place, let me ask something. Have you ever been offended when someone pointed out something? Yes, sometimes. Something not so good about your character? Yes. It happens, doesn't it? It's kind of easy to be offended when someone talks about you, when someone points something out about you. And so here Lucifer is, because he no longer has any root, any foundation, he got rid of that when he started doubting the word of God. So because he has no root, no foundation, he becomes a stony ground hearer. Now watch this. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us, that he also, verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Tell me a little bit about the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches kind of like, you know, wanting the best for yourself. Kind of like wanting self-glorification, like all about me. So let me ask you a question. Did Lucifer doubting the word of God, wayside hearer, lead him to become a stony ground hearer, offended by the word of God? Did that ultimately lead the word of God to be choked out in his heart because now all he cared about was self-glorification? And so what happens? The word of God was what? choked out and he becomes unfruitful if we could use Lucifer as the first case study of what it means to be mentally unhealthy let me break this down God you see when we talk about mental health today most of us go say what yeah I know somebody with mental health issues Right? And that somebody that we know is typically not us. <laughs> but beloved, according to what we are reading here, Lucifer is the first individual to become mentally unstable. And that mental instability came as a result of him rejecting the word of God in his life. Now, now, please, I want you to keep following on because we know that one-third of the angels eventually fell with Lucifer. Is that right? So my question is, how did one-third of the angels fall? How did they end up doing what Lucifer did? Let me say it this way. They allowed Lucifer to get into their heads. Did you catch what I just said? Yeah. They allowed Lucifer to get into their 
and when the enemy of souls gets into your head, have you ever heard someone say, don't let it get into your head? Yeah. Don't let them get into your head? Lucifer was able to get into the heads of angels, and, and for each angel that fell, one of, each of them basically fell because they became one of these grounds. Discontent. I don't understand why God doesn't let us in on his plans. Stony ground. Offended because of the word of God. Ways, uh, uh, I'm sorry, thorny ground. Uh, uh, the, 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 the cares and the, the desires of self-glorification choke out the word. So the angels that fell in heaven are all represented by one of these grounds. But wait a minute. Does the parable go on, go on to say that there was good ground? Were there angels in heaven that did not rebel? Were there angels in heaven that chose to be obedient to the will and the word of God? Absolutely. So, beloved, we've just gone through this parable and seen its connection to what happened in heaven. These three grounds originated in the mind of Lucifer. It led him to become mentally unstable, mentally unhealthy because of his rejection of the word of God, and he gets into the heads of other angels and leads them to the same results. The Bible says in Revelation 12, verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So where was Lucifer and his angels cast? Out to this earth. So let's get into scene two. God creates Adam and Eve. Amen. He makes them in his what? image and in his likeness. Amen. That means he made them holy. Amen. What does it mean to be holy? Whole. How were they made whole? How were they made perfect? They were physically whole. They were spiritually whole. And they were what? Mentally healthy. Are you with me? What happens? Well, Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, the, the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let me ask you a question. What does the word know mean? What does it mean to know something? To what? To understand. So let me ask you a question now. Was Satan coming to Adam and Eve in the garden and saying, there are things you don't understand that God is holding back from you? Did, they, did he approach Adam and Eve like that? What does the parable say? Those upon whom the seed is thrown and they understand what? Not. Did Satan lead Adam and Eve to think there are things you don't understand about God? And as a result of that, did he plant doubt in the heart of Eve? Yes. Yea, has God really said that you can't touch the tree? That you can't eat the tree? In the moment that Eve entertains that doubt, what has she become? A wayside hearer. Before she was mentally healthy and holy, but now she is entertaining doubt and what happens to her mentally? She becomes mentally unstable. Now, I get what most of us think in here. When we hear the word mentally unstable, we think we have our picture of what mentally unstable means. And I get that. And I'm not discounting that. But what I'm trying to tell you is that in heaven's eyes, there is another meaning for mentally unstable. 
And it is when you get off of the sure foundation of the word of God, you become mentally unstable, even though you can hold a job and even though you can go about life's activities as if nothing is wrong, heaven says that is mentally unhealthy. So, so Lucifer leads Adam and Eve, to, to, or uh, Eve specifically, to doubt the word of God. Remember the parable. But he that receives seed into the stony places, the same is he that hears the word and along with joy receives it, yet has no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. So my question is, having removed the root, the foundation, which is trust in the word of God, did Adam or did Eve now become offended at the word of God? Huh. God is hiding something from me. How dare he? And now, listen, with that doubt firmly planted, with the root gone, the foundation gone, and she is now entertaining doubt, and she is now offended at the word of God, my question is, do the cares of this world overtake her love for God? Because now she's realizing, hey, I can be much more than God. I can have freedom outside of God. I can do my own thing. And the cares of this world choked out the word. In other words, beloved, the same thing that happened with Lucifer in heaven, in heaven now is happening to Adam and Eve in the garden. And the Bible says here in verse 6, uh, uh, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So let me ask you a question. Were Adam and Eve's eyes closed before they ate of the tree? Were they closed? No, how do we know they weren't closed? Because she sees the serpent. The Bible says when, when they saw, that when she saw that the tree was good for, for, for food. In other words, the eyes that are being opened are not her literal eyes. Anyone ever say, I see what you're talking about? What does that mean? I understand. Her understanding was, or her mind was open. But the question is, what mind was opened? The answer is, it was the carnal mind. And beloved, the carnal mind is a mentally unhealthy and unstable mind. And so their minds are open. And, and now check this out. When their minds are open, what have they lost? Mental stability, mental health. Now watch this. God comes to them in the garden, right? And you remember what God said to Adam? First of all, what do they do when God comes to them in the garden? Why are they hiding? Because they're what? Yeah, give me something else though. I know they're afraid, but give me, because they are mentally unstable, mentally unhealthy. They are now looking at God as one who is coming to destroy them. They're looking at God with fear. They are discouraged. They are depressed. Are they feeling all these things? And then watch this. God says to them, who told you that you were naked? You've read that verse before, right? Who told you? Who, somebody told Adam and Eve that they were naked? Who do you think it was that told them that? Along with Satan. You know what Satan does? Satan leads you to move away from the word of God. He leads you to doubt the word of God. And then he points to your shame. That's what he does. 
And basically what he is doing is he is, he is getting into your head. That's what he's all about. If I can get into your head and tell you how, 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 how wicked you are, how, how, how you know, far away from God you are, if I can get into your head and totally discourage you and totally move you away from the foundation, which is the word of God, then I have you in the palm of my hand. That's what he's trying to do. I would suggest to you, don't let Satan get into your head. Because that's what he does, does, beloved. He gets into your head to try to drive you into mental instability. What were the signs of their mental instability? Depression. Discouragement. Fear. And I ask you, when, when you look at these, the, the, the fruit of their rejection of the word of God, you can see how as a society, you wonder why, you know, mental health cases are, you know, growing and mental health has become such a big issue. Beloved, I believe that part of the reason is because as mankind continues on, we get further and further away from God. So Adam and Eve, all three grounds are manifested in them. And this is why Genesis 3.15, the Bible says, God comes to them in the garden and says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between, between what? Thy seed. Thy seed and who? Seed. What is the parable talking about? A sower went forth to what? So. Beloved, listen to me. In this text, God is, as it were, saying, listen, the purpose of the gospel is to redeem you from the stony ground. It is to redeem you from the wayside ground. It is to redeem you from the thorny ground. In other words, listen, beloved, we come into this world mentally unstable because the carnal mind is what enmity against God this verse tells us that God was going to send seed that would result in bringing us back into our right minds God cares about your depression. Amen. He cares about your fears. He cares about your discouragements. And the purpose of the gospel is to deliver you from those things. So God begins sowing the word. You see, this parable also explains the history of the entire Old Testament. You'll remember that the first ground represented those who did not understand. Are you, are you with me? Well, listen, after the fall of man, you can read through the book of Genesis all the way up to Genesis chapter 6, where as man began to multiply, they became evil. And the Bible says in Genesis 6 that their hearts, God saw that the hearts of men were only what? Evil continually the imaginations of men and that word imagination points to the understanding so if the understanding of men was only evil continually it represents a group of people who are wayside hearers and because they did not understand the word of God what ends up happening to them a flood comes and they are destroyed well, after the flood, we have the story of Abraham, and Abraham comes upon the scene. He's going to be the father of a very great what? A very great nation, a very great multitude. But you know what happened to this nation, right? This nation, Israel, uh, they end up uh, in captivity to Egypt for 400 years, and then God comes to deliver them. But check this out. Through that process, the children of Israel are experiencing persecution and tribulation. Are they not? 
And yet because they had no root, it, many of them had no root in themselves, did they make it into the promised land? The first ground, think with me, the first ground, the flood. Wayside hearers, we don't understand the word and therefore we reject it. The second ground, stony ground hearers, going through persecution and we're going to murmur and complain and we're offended when God comes to try to correct us. That is the whole history of Old Testament Israel particularly their journey from Egypt into the promised land. But there is a third ground. You remember, this ground represents those who the cares of the world choke out the word. Let me ask you a question. When the children of Israel get into the promised land, we've got it good now. We're settled in the promised land. Did the cares of worldliness begin to enter into Israel? And you know the story because they actually continued on like that until they entered, ended up in Babylonian captivity and then God set them free again. And now check this out. We think that, well, what is going to happen to the people of God because it just seems like they continue to mess up. But beloved, there is a fourth ground and that fourth ground is the ground in which good fruit would be brought forth. You say, Pastor, what is that fourth ground? Jesus himself, when he comes to this earth, he tells us in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 23, he says, in fact, before we even read that, Jesus Christ is the very seed that Genesis chapter 3, 15 was talking about. And what did he say about himself in John chapter 12, verse 23? Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Praise God for the coming of Jesus. Because every ground before him yielded very little good. But when he came upon the scene, he was that seed that was planted into good ground. And from his death, burial, and resurrection, he would bring forth much fruit. So watch this. When Satan comes up, when Jesus comes on the scene, Satan knows that this is the seed. Did you hear me? Satan knows that this is a seed. So what does he do? He approaches him in the wilderness. How many times does he tempt the seed? Three times. You think those three times have anything to do with the three grounds? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You got to see this because in Matthew chapter 3, Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, it says, When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Beloved, listen to me. Satan was trying to get into the head of Jesus. Doubt the word of God. Jesus, do you really understand why you're here? Do you really understand your mission? Like, like, why don't you just go ahead and eat? But Jesus said, no, I will eat when my father tells me to eat. It's as if Jesus was, Satan was saying to him, Yea, has God said that you shall not eat? And Jesus rebukes him by saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, he's saying, My foundation is sure. And as long as I stand upon the word of God, you cannot get into my head. The second temptation, he takes him to a high place and says, throw yourself down. Right there, he's tempting, them, tempting him, saying, look, you know, he's trying to offend him. Are you really the son of God? If you're really the son of God, prove it. Throw yourself down. He's trying, you know, if someone said, came to you and said, are you really a Christian? How many of you would probably get offended? And maybe you might not because you're like, yeah. But how many of you would be like, you know what, how dare you ask me? If I'm a follower of Jesus. 
And the person said, oh yeah, well prove it. How many of you, how many of you would go out and prove it? <laughs> he was trying to get Jesus to be offended, but Jesus said, I'm not even going there because I trust my father. When the word of God is, un, is, when you're solidly standing on the word of God, Satan cannot get into your head. The Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law, and what? Nothing shall offend them. And then you know the third thing Satan does, right? He shows Jesus all the glories and the riches of the world. What was the thorny ground about? The cares and the riches of the... He's trying to choke the word out of Jesus. And Jesus overcomes all because he is mentally sound. He overcomes all these grounds and goes on to produce much fruit in his ministry, doesn't he? Doesn't he? He is the seed that was planted in the good ground. And so you, I want you to understand, beloved, how, how deep this parable is because it's trying to show us something that when Christ overcame, he was basically, he was basically showing, saying, listen, I want you to understand the mind that is in me. Let this mind that is in me be also in you. Why? Because without this mind, Satan's going to get into your head. And he's going to lead you to doubt me and to not trust and to fear and to be discouraged and to be down. He's going to lead you to do all these things. So I'm trying to show you, look, he tried to get into my head and he could not. Why? Because of this mind. I want that mind to be in you. Beloved, that's the purpose of the gospel. He's trying to remove our minds and get us into his mind. So watch this. Jesus comes and that's the goal, that's the, the, the gift he's offering. A new mind, a new heart will I give you. But you know what, it's, it's amazing. Because there was a prophecy, right, that stated that Jesus would, was coming. And, and I know we talk about Genesis 3.15, but there was another prophecy in the book of Daniel, and it was called the 70-week prophecy. That 70-week prophecy pointed to the coming of Christ. But I want you to follow this carefully, beloved. Listen carefully. Did the Jews understand... The mission of Christ. And so they rejected him. Oh, so we might say that the Jews were wayside hearers. I'm, I'm giving you the seed. That's the son of God. But the Jews, they were like, yeah, no, we don't understand. And so they rejected him. Okay, what about the disciples? Did persecution come upon the disciples that led them to forsake Jesus? Yes. Didn't Jesus say, smite the shepherd and the sheep will be what? Will be scattered? Why did they flee Jesus? Well, they understood his mission, but why did they flee? Literally speaking, why did they run? Why did they run away? Why did they? Why were they? Do you remember when they were hiding in the uh, in the? Uh, they were hiding for fear. They were hiding for persecution. Remember, Jesus said, "You all should leave me this night." And and then and then uh, uh, Peter said, "What?" And Peter got offended. Peter got, what's the word I just used? Offended. Offended. Lord, though everyone forsake you, I will never forsake you. Did he forsake Jesus? Yes. In time of persecution. And so, so even the disciples, even the disciples represented one of those grounds. 
Now the Romans are the ones that put him to death. All they cared about was what? The cares of this world. In other words, all everyone surrounding Jesus represented one of those grounds in his death. No one stood with him. He was the seed that was planted in good ground. But check this out, beloved. Praise God, because when Jesus dies and is buried and resurrected, listen to what happens. A Roman soldier, the centurion, looks upon his dead body and says, truly, this was the Son of God. On the day of Pentecost, Jews, remember the same ones that were, check this out, guys. They rejected him all because they were all mentally unstable. But he dies in order to save people from all those categories. Yes. He saved the Romans. Jews, devout Jews from all over the world were in, were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They were converted. And of course we know the disciples who at one time forsook him were now his chief Promoters. Beloved, Jesus died to save all of us from our mental health issues. Because guess what? We have them. We have them. Don't look down at your nose at someone who you think, oh yeah, that person has mental issues because they are suffering with discouragement. Guess what? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All struggle with the carnal mind, and the carnal mind is designed to keep you mentally unstable in the eyes of heaven. God tells us, that he sent his son into the world to save us from our sins, to save us from our discouragement, to save us from the things that make us mentally unstable in the eyes of heaven. So watch this, guys. If, if the Jews represented that group of people, when the sea was planted, they were wayside hearers. That's the 70 week prophecy. Is there another time prophecy after the 70 weeks? The answer is yes. Otherwise, I would not have asked. <laughs> is there a time prophecy after the 70 weeks in the book of Daniel? Yes, yes it is the 1260 year time prophecy. What happens in that time prophecy? What? Per person what? Persecution. Watch this, guys. In the 70 week prophecy, the Jews represent the first ground. They did not understand and therefore they rejected the word of God. But in the next prophecy, the 1260, that represents a group of people who go through persecution. And if you are not grounded on the word of God, you fall away. They fell away during that persecution. I'm going somewhere with this. So if the first ground can be tied to the 70 weeks and the second ground can be tied to the 1260, then the third ground, the tw is there a third prophecy? Yes. What is that prophecy? The 2300 day pro time prophecy. And what is the issue with the third ground? The cares of this world. It's no longer persecution because we're not living through persecution today, are we? It's no longer not understanding who the Messiah is. We all know who he is, but beloved, listen to me. The thing we are dealing with most today is the cares of this world. Did Jesus say just before he comes again that it'll be like in the days of Noah? They'll be marrying and giving in marriage and people will not know until he comes again. Yes. Beloved, being caught up in the cares of this world and not understanding that the foundation of your walk is the Word of God, it leads to mental health issues. And let me speak very clearly. You see, when you have anger issues, that's a mental health problem. Y'all not feeling me. When you don't love your neighbor, that is a mental health issue. 
When you have hatred in your heart, that is a mental health issue. When you cannot get along, when you argue, when you do all of these things, when you are not walking in the character and likeness of Christ, you are dealing with a mental health issue. Listen carefully, guys. Because though the first ground, the seven-week prophecy, are those that are wayside hearers, and though the second ground, the 12 six are those who go through persecution and either stay firm or fell out of the truth because of persecution, and though that last, the, the, the third ground, represents the, the, the hearers who are taken up with the cares of this world, there is a fourth ground, and it is the ground called the good ground. At the end of time, God is going to have a people who are bringing forth much fruit to the glory of God. Amen. And what is that fruit? It is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which demonstrates that you are mentally holy, healthy, stable. Thus the Bible says, grieve not the Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. <laughs> who is God going to be sealing at the end of time? Those who are mentally stable. What does that mean, Pastor? Those who know how to love. Those who know how to be forgiving. Those who know how to be merciful. Because, beloved, listen to me. If you don't have that, let me tell it to you again. You are suffering with mental instability. And yes, God's church, there are people in God's church, many people who suffer with mental instability. And it's not because, oh, they're crazy. No, it's just because they don't have love in their hearts. Beloved, don't let Satan get in your head. Because if he gets in your head, he's going to make you mentally unstable. He's going to lead you to not like people for literally no reason. I don't like him. Why? Ah. Uh, I'm not sure. Man, you're crazy. <laughs> That's mental instability. When you are at war with someone for reasons you don't even know, that's mental instability. And Satan will bring that mental instability right here into the house of God, into the church of God, and he will do it on Sabbath morning. And he will do it to try to get into your head. When Jesus comes again, there's going to be a group of people who rise up from the ground. It's not going to be the wayside hearers because they were never planted. It's not going to be the stony ground hearers because they could not bring forth fruit. It's not going to be the thorny ground hearers because they were not ready for God. It's only going to be those who died in Christ. So the Bible says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead, the dead where? In Christ. Now, beloved, we can just stop right there, and I want you to understand the dead in Christ represent two groups of people, the dead and the living. Did you catch that? Because you can be dead and dead in Christ, but you can also be alive and dead in Christ. So, beloved, it is only the dead in Christ, those who died in Christ and were buried with him. That will be caught up because they represent the first fruits, the good fruits that will be brought forth when Jesus comes again. Amen. Beloved, there are many people who are struggling with mental health issues. 
And for far too long, we put off mental health as something that those people struggle with. Yea, they have mental health issues, and we need to pray for them. But beloved, I'm here to tell you today that if you carry animosity in your heart against a fellow brother or sister, if you cannot speak peaceably unto a fellow brother or sister, if you cannot speak peaceably in your home or wherever it is, you have mental health issues and the only way they can be solved is to let the mind of Christ Amen. be in you beloved that's why he gives us that helmet of salvation so that Satan cannot get into your heads I'm closing with this there's a parable of a demoniac you guys remember this story the demonia that was cutting himself you know isn't cutting one of those signs of depression and here you have this demonia cutting himself and he is he is in the tombs and chains couldn't hold him nothing could be done for him and then the Bible tells us that that Jesus comes to the shore and when the demoniac sees him he runs to Jesus and says what have we to do with thee and Jesus says what is your name and he says my name is what Legion, for we are many. Let me ask you, do you think that legion represented all those grounds? The ground of the wayside here, the ground of the stony ground here, the ground of the thorny ground, all of those were in this man. And the Bible tells us that Jesus had power to rebuke these demons. And I love, the, I love how the verse puts it. I've I got to read it to you. Uh, it's just one verse. It's Matthew, I'm sorry. Mark chapter 5. I will read it in your hearing. After the demons are cast out and, and they run into these pigs and the pigs run down this hill, the Bible says that the people, uh, verse 14, they that fed the swine told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legions, the legions sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Beloved, God wants us to be in our right minds. It's the mind that he designed for us, which is the mind of Christ. But many of us get offended by that mind. Many of us don't understand that mind. Many of us, the cares of this world are more important than that mind. And as a result, we never get the mind of Christ. And as a result of not having the mind of Christ, Satan has free access to get into your head all day long and all night long. It's time to get Satan out of your head. It's time for us to get the mind of Christ. It's time for us to put on the helmet of salvation, beloved. My appeal to you this morning, give me the mind of Christ. Give me the mind of Christ. Why? Because I am suffering with mental health issues. And Lord, I need your mind to counteract the lies, the discouragement, the depression, the fear, the worry that Satan has me playing over and over and over again in my mind. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. It may not be all of you, but you're saying today, yeah, I've got mental health issues and I freely acknowledge that. Lord, please. Deliver me from this anger. Deliver me from this hatred. Deliver me from this depression and this discouragement. I don't want Satan getting in my head any longer. Heavenly Father, forgive us for we have sinned. Forgive us, Lord, for allowing the enemy to get into our heads. He has told us that we are no good, that we are unworthy. 
that there is no hope. But Lord, we choose not to believe his lies. Let the mind that was in your son Jesus, we ask that mind to be in us now. Heal us, Lord. That we may have the fruit of the Spirit. We thank you, Jesus, for hearing and answering because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Would you remain standing as we sing our closing song? Our closing song is Give Me Jesus, hymn number 305. Give Me Jesus.